Welcome. My name is Nadia McConnell. I'm president of the U.S. Ukraine Foundation, and I am pleased to welcome you today to another discussion by the National Security Task Force of the Friends of Ukraine Network. A very important topic. Is the United States committed to a Ukrainian victory? This is a question I think that many have been asking, as well as this task force. I might say that uh, for everybody, including our task force members, thank you for participating. Uh, people are anxious to hear your views on this. The March 16 uh, discussion that you held, Crimea in Ukraine's control is key to genuine peace and prosperity, has to date 23,266 views. Uh, and it keeps rising. The a 7L discussion, I think, that also was held on December the 29th, what is the goal of assistance to Ukraine, has nearly 4,000 views. So it seems like that we keep going around this major question, what is the goal and is the United States committed to a Ukrainian victory? We couldn't have a better uh, group of discussants than what we have this morning. Uh, first, we have retired General Phil Breedlove. He's former Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, and now at the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Tech. Luke Coffey has held several senior uh, foreign affairs positions in both the American and British government, and now is a senior fellow at Hudson Institute. Ambassador John Herps, former US ambassador to Ukraine, and now is the head of the Eurasia Center at the Atlanta Council. Retired Lieutenant General Ben Hodges, former commander of all U.S. Army troops in Europe, and now with Human Rights First. Bob McConnell, former Assistant Attorney General for the U.S. Department of Justice and a co-founder of the U.S. Ukraine Foundation. And, and finally, and not least, Ambassador Sandy Virchbaugh, former U.S. Ambassador to Russia and former Deputy Secretary of, of NATO. Let's get down to the questions. Bill. Uh, I, when asked to give speeches, I very um, liberally use your acronym DIME to talk about the different parts of, of the war, meaning diplomacy, information, military, and economics. Uh, in my view, I think that while Putin may not be doing as well on the military side, I think he is succeeding quite well on the information and propaganda war. And part of the success is the fact that we have so many questions about success in Ukraine. So first, let's start talking about what are the US strategic interests in helping Ukraine defeat the Kremlin? Bill, please. Well, first of all, Nadia, thanks for having me. It's good to be amongst uh, such learned friends again, and uh, hopefully I can bring a little uh, insight. Um, there are a myriad of people and reasons thrown out there as far as U.S. interests and why should we be concerned and why would we be interested enough to invest in this when we need to be, quote unquote, leaning to the east and thinking of China. So what I'm going to do is just offer you four things that leap into my mind and I'll do them rather quickly, and if you have uh, more questions, we could talk about them later. Having uh, lived in Europe myself eight times, I think America is, uh, it wants to see a Europe free, whole, and stable, uh, not continually under the thumb of a tyrant who is attempting to rebuild an empire. And we'll talk more than once I think in my notes and the rest of the conversation of how this particular individual has disrupted that vision of Europe uh, three times already in our recent history. Second, uh, it's hard to explain and it's even harder to sort of measure, but we, we want to work towards maintaining what we call liberal democracy. Uh, a Europe that lives and breathes in, quote unquote, Western values, uh, a Europe and, in a, and a world standing against war crimes and war criminals. We do not 
associate with or tolerate rape as a weapon of war, murder as a weapon, weapon of war, uh, kidnapping and deporting children and family as a weapon of war. These, these tools, which we see as we uncover formerly held Russian spaces in Ukraine, are abhorrent to what we see as normal uh, uh, types of uh, activities. We need to maintain our liberal democracy in ac not accepting and not acquiescing uh, yet again to the use of force to change internationally recognized borders. We want to see in a very uh, concrete way freedom of navigation and thereby, thereby trade in areas like the Black Sea. Um, we do not want to tolerate ports of Northern Black Sea being militarily controlled by Russia sitting in Crimea as a, uh, a platform by which to launch force. We want to see Ukrainian ports uh, and economy flourish. We want to see NATO ports and economy flourish in the Black Sea. And we should expect to see a world flow of goods and as we have seen a free world flow of food coming out of the Northern Black Sea. And then finally, I would say that uh, it, it, is a, it is a decision that we need to make now. Do we address Mr. Putin now or in the future? I'm often asked, well, why do you assume there's gonna be a future? I think the track record is pretty clear. The West's response to 2008 in Georgia was inadequate to task. I think it was a major reason why we saw Russia's incursion into first Crimea and then the Donbass in 2014, whereby the West's response was yet again inadequate to task. And that then was clearly a contributing factor to Russia's now third invasion of Ukraine uh, in 2022. And the history will now judge us as to whether our response is yet again going to be inadequate to task. But I believe that it is important to address this behavior now. If we allow this bad behavior to be rewarded as the West did in 08, as the West did in 14, if we allow this bad behavior to be yet again rewarded in 2022, then I think that uh, our interest will not be served in the future when we see iteration number four once Mr. Putin regenerates his forces. I think I'll leave it with those four items, Nadia. Thank you. Well, thank you, Phil. Uh, and thank you for uh, reminding us uh, of this, um, I don't want to say new uh, wrinkle, but the fact that we are now dealing also with a, a war criminal. The ICC ruling clearly has identified Putin uh, you know, as uh, guilty of genocide. So all these discussions have this added layer, I think, that need to be incorporated when we making uh, decisions. Um, next, I'm gonna uh, turn to Luke. Uh, Luke, you just recently had an article uh, in the Wall Street Journal, I think the, on the 17th of April, Ukraine should take Crimea from Russia. Uh, Crimea seems to be one of the key uh, parts of what I would call the success of Putin's propaganda, uh, that somehow uh, it's been, it's theirs and, the, and they should have it. Uh, Luke, you, what, what about uh, Crimea, its importance and vulnerability? Thanks. Uh, good morning or good afternoon if you're watching uh, or if you're over in Europe. You know, thanks for uh, having me on to speak about this issue today. Before I talk about Crimea, I just want to take 30 seconds and talk about the, the to answer your question in the, uh, of the title of this uh, webinar, which is, is the United States committed to a Ukrainian victory? I don't think it is committed to a Ukrainian victory. I think we're committed to uh, Ukraine not being defeated, but we're not committed to that victory. And we have to start wanting Ukraine to win 
more than we just hope that Russia is going to lose. And right now we don't see um, this uh, attitude being taken by the administration. Now, as the, uh, as the war continues on uh, and fatigue starts to set in, I could see a situation where there's desperation by some Western policymakers to find a way to end the fighting at any cost. Even if the Ukrainians don't want to stop fighting, I could see a situation where Western policymakers <clears throat> pressure Kiev into, um, into getting, uh, going to the uh, negotiating table. Uh, and there's already some talk about in the media today uh, about the White House being concerned uh, that the upcoming uh, Ukrainian counterattack won't deliver the results that people are hoping for. And and already we're discussing, you know, what what will this mean for continued U.S. support? Um, and, and as part of this narrative, you often hear people say that maybe Kiev could accept a special status for Crimea. Or maybe the conflict could be frozen with Russia still in control of Crimea. And I think such an outcome, whether it's a diplomatic settlement or a military settlement, would amount to geopolitical negligence and would merely kick, uh, kick the can down the road for uh, future generations to have to deal with uh, another crisis uh, in the region. Um, Ukrainian control over Crimea matters, uh, and, and I'm about to give the reason why. Uh, but in simple terms, uh, Crimea is a, a part of Ukraine in the same way Alaska, also once formerly part of, of Russia, is, is a part of the United States. And of course, we Americans would never tolerate a uh, Russian occupation of Alaska. So why should we expect anything differently from uh, the Ukrainians? Some uh, like to argue that Crimea's history makes it uh, difficult to determine its status. And actually, if you look at it, it's relatively straightforward. Uh, when the Soviet Union dissolved and Ukraine reemerged as an independent state, uh, the whole international community, even the Russian Federation, recognized Crimea as being part of Ukraine. In 1991, there was a referendum held in every oblast, every region across Ukraine to decide if they wanted independence from the Soviet Union or if they wanted to uh, remain part of a new uh, Russian Federation. Uh, every... Uh, Every oblast, every region, including Crimea, had a majority voting in support of independence. On the same day of that referendum, there were the first presidential elections in Ukraine since, uh, since independence, and all six candidates supported independence. Uh, the message was clear, I think, at the time that the, the Ukrainians wanted to be independent, and they saw and considered Crimea as being part of the rest of Ukraine. To top it all off, Russia. Um, acknowledged and recognized Ukraine's independence and territorial integrity uh, almost three weeks before the United States did. Uh, so uh, even Russia at the time recognized this to be the case. History also shows us that Crimea is geographically and economically and politically linked to the rest of Ukraine and therefore has to be governed as such. In a simple topographical sense, Crimea is merely the extension of the Ukrainian steppes. The peninsula has no natural land connection with the Russian Federation. Uh, Crimea uh, has been economically linked to southern Ukraine. This has been the case since the 15th century when the Crimean Khanate first emerged, uh, where the Crimean Khanate not only ruled over the Crimean Peninsula, but much of Ukraine's modern day Kherson, Zaporizhia uh, uh, Oblast, and also in western Donetsk Oblast. Um, even after Catherine the Great annexed Crimea in 1783, it was administratively made part of that region of what is now southern, uh, modern day southern Ukraine. And when uh, Khrushchev uh, infamously or famously reassigned Crimea from the Russian Soviet Federative uh, Socialist Republic to the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist <laughs> Republic in 1954, uh, according to the minute notes at the time, the decision was taken in part, and I quote, because of the commonality of the economy, the territorial proximity, and the close economic and cultural ties between the Crimean Oblast and the Ukrainian SSR. So even they knew in, in 1954 that Crimea was better off governed and ruled uh, with the rest of Ukraine from Kyiv. I would argue leaving the peninsula outside of Ukraine's control is a break from history and not a continuation of it. 
But why does this matter for the United States and for the future of, of Ukraine? If Russia is allowed to maintain a military presence uh, on Crimea, it will simply use that as a springboard to launch attacks against Ukraine again in the future. We've already seen Russia using Crimea as a safe area to refit and refurbish damaged vehicles that are eventually returned to the front lines. They'd be doing the same thing if the conflict is frozen, but on steroids. Uh, Russian control of Crimea also threatens Ukraine's commercial shipping which is vital to Ukraine's economy, especially with global exports, and also undermines the, the grain deal and the export of grain to the global south. Also, if, if Russia remained in control of Crimea and there was this ongoing threat or possibility of future conflict uh, that would start up again, this would deter the much needed international investors from taking part in Ukraine's reconstruction efforts. And from a US point of view, Crimea is used by Russia as a springboard to launch military operations and influence outside of the Black Sea region, whether it's the Eastern Med, the Levant, the Maghreb. We've seen examples of Russia using Crimea as the springboard. So it is in our interests that Ukraine gets control back over the peninsula, uh, just from a, a geopolitical sense. Um, as Ukrainians advance on the battlefield, the military contest for Crimea becomes more of a reality. Uh, Ukraine has the, uh, the motivation and the momentum. We have the weapons and the munitions. Let's give Ukraine the tools that they need to get the job done now and not later down the road, making this just another problem we're going to have to deal with. And I'm sure uh, my, my good friend Ben Hodges will lay out in chapter and verse how <laughs> Ukraine can do this. Uh, so I'll, I'll stop right there. Thanks. Well, thank you, Luke. Uh, perhaps for another time, we could talk about the fact that there are some in Russia that are talking about Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> so um, next, let's talk about um, is the U.S. giving Ukraine what it needs? Because some of the arguments that we're hearing about the fatigue setting in, and I know that this group has discussed this and answered this. And so uh, Robert, maybe you could summarize um, the answer to this question. Are we giving Ukraine what it needs and when it needs it? Well, the answer to the question is no. Uh, the background on that is, yes, we have given an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of military support to Ukraine, but we've given it late and not when it was most needed. And that continues to this very day. And Luke made comment about the stories coming out from the uh, uh, White House that people in the administration are concerned that if this uh, anticipated uh, off offensive does not succeed or succeed completely, uh, what's gonna happen? It's gonna get, it could get the, uh, administration in a bottle. Well, they got themselves in this bottle. They haven't given Ukraine what it needs to win this war and to make this counteroffensive what it could be. If you don't give long-range strategic specific missiles to Ukraine, they can't do many of the things that have to be done to make everything work. I mean, I'm not going to step into Ben Hodges' territory where he can walk down every little detail of this, but the fact of the matter is, the White House worrying about this is a little bit late. Now, they could, you know, get on and pick up the phone and call Zelensky and hold back the counteroffensive until we get those missiles to you. And we're, they're on the plane now. C-5As are taking off. We need to get them what they need. It's in our strategic, national, and international interests. And we have not done that, despite the fact that the administration can list over and over and over what we have given. But it's always been late. It's never been when it could be the most effective. And that's the situation that we're in. I'll leave it at there. I've got, you know, I've got Ben following up and Sandy and and then our utility infielder, John Herbst, can pick up everything that nobody else has gotten. Uh, thank you for that. So, Ben, it seems like you really did stir up things when uh, in the discussion on December the 29th, I believe that is the first time where you clearly stated that Ukraine could take Crimea, could succeed and take Crimea by the end of the summer. And you said that multiple times uh, since then. 
And it seems to me that a lot of the things that we're hearing coming back from the White House are kind are in um, trying to uh, argue with you on that point. Uh, so today, you still think uh, Ukraine can take Crimea by the end of the summer? Absolutely, um, if we give them what they need. I mean, this this whole thing, not just Crimea, the whole thing could be over by the end of this year. It's up to the United States. And I think UK and Germany and others would follow along if the United States made it very clear that our desired strategic outcome is that Ukraine defeats Russia on the battlefield and, and fulfills all that President Zelensky has uh, described as what victory looks like. And I, I can't, and I know everybody on this call has been trying to figure out why is the administration reluctant to do that. And I, I think uh, they still are not convinced that um, uh, Ukraine is able to do it. Uh, when I hear the Pentagon repeatedly say, I think exactly what you said earlier, Nadia, that uh, even if they do this big offensive, uh, it might not deliver what we're all hoping. Well, of course not, if we don't give them what they need. I mean, this is a self-fulfilling prophecy by the by the joint staff, and I, I don't understand that. So I think there's a little bit of psychological, they just still can't imagine that little Ukraine could somehow defeat big Russia. Uh, which shows a lack of uh, imagination, but also understanding of what's going on on the ground. Secondly, I think the administration um, is perhaps, and this is 100% speculation on my part, they're not prepared for the outcome if Ukraine defeats Russia. I mean, what happens? You know, and and and, and uh, when the dog catches the car, you know, <laughs> what does it do? And so I think the administration is uncomfortable with the idea, as are many of our uh, European allies, with what happens what happens next. And so I think that's part of the reason they haven't declared we want Ukraine to win. And then the third thing, I don't know this, but I think China um, is influencing the administration or considerations about China that maybe the Chinese have said, no, we do not want a, a catastrophic collapse of Russian Federation which is which they think might follow the liberation of Crimea. So I've been trying to figure out how do we influence the administration, and to do that, we'd have to understand why did they think what they think. So I'm I'm all over the map on trying to figure that out. Um, if we say if we do what Clausewitz says, you know, the the political leadership has to describe what is the end to be achieved. That's the job of our civilian leadership. If they do that, then we can we can accomplish it. In the absence of that, then we're going to continue um, delivering incrementally. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but that's the part that's frustrating. Uh, Martin Harum, who was the chief of defense from Estonia, uh, this morning he was quoted as saying that Russia will 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 never be safe from Russia until it breaks up into a lot of little countries. I I thought that was a powerful statement from the chief of defense of Estonia to acknowledge that as long as Russia remains a the Russian Federation, we're never going to be able to, to deal with them uh, or the threat will always be there. And General Sir Richard Sheriff, I heard him the other day um, highlight the fact that uh, you know, Russia has never been a nation state. It's been an empire of some sort from its very beginning. And because of that, it's never had to reckon with its past. And until it does, will keep getting Putin or whoever comes after him. And so this never stops. So this is why I think long-term, it's in our interest to make sure that Russia is absolutely defeated, beaten on the battlefield. And then we and then it forces them to have the reckoning that Germany had and that Japan had after the end of the Second World War. What do they need? I, I think um, you isolate the Crimean Peninsula by severing the land bridge. And, and I don't know this, but I think that's what this uh, offensive is gonna be about when it, when and where and however it happens. Um, it's, it's, it's ultimately about isolation of Crimea. And then you bring up the uh, long range precision weapons to uh, begin to make Crimean Peninsula untenable. Uh, Sakir, General Cavoli said that precision can defeat mass if you have enough time. And, and Russia's only advantage is mass infantry 
And so you neutralize that advantage by going after headquarters, ammunition storage, transportation nodes with precision weapons. It, it just, it takes some time. If they have that capability, then I think the peninsula becomes untenable for them. And, uh, and then the third phase, of course, you have to actually enter the peninsula uh, after that and clear it. I think once the Black Sea fleet's gone, the Russian Air Force is no longer flying there. I think this becomes a much more achievable task. Ben, um, wow. Um, you bring up some things that really do require more in-depth discussion, but perhaps not for this morning. Um, this this notion that somehow we uh, can decide whether or not uh, the current uh, Russian Federation is going to split up or not, uh, and that it's somehow in our hands, I think is a false premise. This is very reminiscent of the efforts that were undertaken to keep the Soviet Union together. Uh, if we recall that period, uh, this was not, uh, the breakup was not welcomed, even though for, for decades we celebrated captive nations. But when the time came, uh, there was a lot of uh, fear of, of it actually taking place. But again, I think that's a topic for another time. Um, <clears throat> Sandy, um, again, Crimea seems to be at the heart of um, this discussion about how much to give Ukraine, what is a Ukrainian victory? And I think this group has and many times said that it appears that the goal may be to try to force Ukraine into a negotiation uh, about uh, Crimea uh, for the stable peace. We've had a webinar discussion about that, but I think it, it bears repeating uh, what is this, a, is this a real goal of possibility for peace? Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Nadia, for uh, hosting this uh, important discussion. Let me say at the, at the outset that I agree with uh, my colleagues who've already spoken that we haven't embraced the goal of Ukrainian victory, and it's high time that we do so. Uh, I regret that since the very outset of this conflict, uh, the U.S. administration and many of our allies have allowed ourselves to be basically uh, intimidated by Russian threats of escalation, Russian nuclear coercion, uh, leading to our policy of constraining what kind of uh, weapons and equipment we're prepared to give the Ukrainians. And the, the risks of such an incremental approach are, are showing. And uh, it's, it's high time that we, uh, we break out of this self-imposed uh, constraint. Unfortunately, in, in recent weeks, even greater pessimism has entered into the public debate about the Ukrainians' prospects for their upcoming counteroffensive. And this has been fueled by the leak of US intelligence reporting, expressing doubts about Kiev's ability to take back significant territory uh, when, they, when they launch the, uh, the long-awaited counteroffensive next month or June, whenever it happens. Many experts and pundits are predicting a protracted stalemate as the most likely scenario, which would weaken the Ukrainian armed forces and undermine international political and financial support for Ukraine. <clears throat> Some of the skeptics go so far as to argue that Ukraine should quit while it's ahead and seek a negotiated solution with the implication that Kiev should be prepared to give up territory, starting with Crimea, to end the killing and allow humanitarian reconstruction to begin, rather than prolonging the war into 2024. Now, there's a lot of problems with this, this position regarding the uh, need for, for negotiations. There's no evidence that Putin is at all serious about negotiations, and I don't see any incentive for him right now to get serious uh, anytime soon. He hasn't scaled back his war aims uh, one bit. His negotiating position, as far as Kremlin spokesmen explain it, is still uh, basically Ukraine's total capitulation an acceptance of the annexation of additional territories, even those that Russia doesn't control. And I think that signifies the fact that Putin still believes time is on his side, that he can outlast the Ukrainians and uh, their Western backers, and that Ukraine will ultimately submit to Russian hegemony. And needs, needless to say, Putin must be encouraged by the declining support for Ukraine among Republicans in the US Congress, 
And he's certainly going to try to reinforce that trend as much as he can with occasional nuclear threats aimed at discouraging the U.S. from providing the capabilities Ukraine needs to prevail. So as the start of the Ukrainian counteroffensive approaches, we need to reaffirm our full support for Ukraine and help Kiev prove the uh, pessimists wrong. We have to re re remind the skeptics that at every stage of this conflict, uh, the Ukrainians have defied all expectations and uh, been far more successful uh, on the battlefield than anyone would have predicted. So now, now's the time to do everything possible to equip, equip the Ukrainians to get the job done, as Luke said, uh, and to deny the, Rus the Russians the fruits of their aggression. Pulling out all the stops in support of the counteroffensive uh, is the best way as well to create conditions that might allow serious negotiations to take place. As the saying goes, by helping the Ukrainians gain the upper hand on the battlefield, we can strengthen Ukraine's hand at the bargaining table and increase the pressure on Russia to end the war on terms favorable to Kiev, or at least to make it clear to the rest of the world that, that it's Russia who is the intransigent party. Now, as others have said, the greatest leverage on Russia would come from enabling Ukraine to put Russian control over Crimea at risk. Crimea is the key to military victory, and it's also the key to a lasting peace. With control over Crimea, Ukraine can become a secure, viable, and prosperous country once again, and a reliable contributor to global peace and stability, including global food and energy security. Backed by effective Western security guarantees that prevent renewed Russian aggression, and that would be, I hope, NATO membership, Ukraine can peacefully coexist as a neighbor of Russia. But if Russia is allowed to keep Crimea, uh, it will be able to prevent Ukraine from being a viable state economically, since Russia will be able to uh, block access to Ukraine's major ports by controlling Crimea and the Northern Black Sea. And if Russia is allowed to keep Crimea and other territory illegally annexed by force, it will undermine that fundamental principle of the rules-based order that you don't change borders by force. In the worst case, it would embolden China to accelerate plans to settle the Taiwan issue by force. And we shouldn't forget that Putin has made clear that in his statements and in the draft treaties that the Russians presented to NATO and the US at the end of last year, at the end of 2021, uh, his ambitions clearly extend beyond Ukraine. And if he gets away with dismembering and subjugating Ukraine, sooner or later, Russia will do the same thing to other neighbors, such as the Baltic states. So let me stress that while it's premature and possibly even counterproductive to push for negotiations now, we shouldn't rule out negotiations at the appropriate time. But when that time comes, the Ukrainians must be the ones who set the goals and the terms of any deal, since they're the ones that are doing the fighting. They have good reason to resist giving up any territory in the wake of Russian brutality, war crimes, and forced Russification policies. The realists who say that Ukraine should settle for a return to the status quo prior to February 2022 are entitled to their opinion, but it's the Ukrainians who have to address these issues, not us. They offered significant flexibility in the talks that were held last March, right after the start of the war. And it was Moscow that walked away, not Kiev. So our role now is to ensure that they have the means to strengthen their negotiating position on the battlefield. Uh, diplomacy time may come, but I suspect it will only be when Putin is facing total defeat, including the prospect of losing control over Crimea. Thanks. Thank you. John, as a uh, chairman of this uh, August uh, task force, I'm going to ask you to really um, pull together some of the, the points that have been made or emphasize some that um, I'll turn it over to you to summarize. Okay, thank you. Look, uh, my colleagues were so strong as expected. There's not that much for me to add. Uh, let me start by saying the key problem, I think, was identified by uh, Bob and, and Sandy, oh, I mean, Luke can go oh, great too, but I mean that, that the problem is that the administration has a policy that is a combination of overly cautious and somewhat inconsistent. 
we have a vital national interest in stopping Putin's uh, revanchist agenda, recognizing, as most of our speakers do, that Putin's objectives go well beyond Ukraine. The smart place, the economical place to stop him is in Ukraine. Sandy identified, I think, the principal reason why the administration has not done the necessary, meaning provide all the weapons that would ensure Ukrainian victory, which is they have been intimidated by Putin's nuclear bluster. I call that behavior unbecoming a superpower. Um, Of course, the United States has to take into account Moscow's nuclear capability. But we had to take into account the Soviet nuclear capability, and we never opined in public and uh, writhed in agony in public about the prospect of the Soviets using nuclear weapons. We've done that here, and that is cut against our national interests. It's also ironic, and irony is part of international relations, because the Chinese have seen us being intimidated by the Russians, and there's been numerous reporting uh, in the papers about China going all in on developing a full nuclear capability because they want to be able to intimidate us too. Very dangerous lesson that we are providing globally. And the administration had a period of, of real spine in September, October, when Biden said, you know, if the Russians use nukes, they will get a devastating response. And they would, then they went back into, you know, again, wringing their hands in public about the possible use of nuclear weapons. That has to stop now. Uh, the inconsistency of administration policy is seen by a point raised by several of my fellow panelists, that they are now agonizing on background that Ukraine may not win this next offensive. And of course, as my smart colleagues pointed out, this would not be an issue if we provided Ukraine everything it needed. But let me offer uh, one point on Ukraine's upcoming counteroffensive. No one in the world, with the exception of maybe Zelensky and one or two of his aides and one or two of his generals, knows where that offensive is going to be. And that's smart. Um, it's possible that given what the assets that it has and its extraordinary leadership and high morale, that even without ascending the longer range fires, they can break the land bridge connecting Russia to occupied Donbass to Crimea. Maybe. I don't know if that's true. I do know this. Ukraine has the ability to launch a somewhat minimum, minimally a somewhat successful counteroffensive. And by that, I mean regaining several hundred square kilometers of mile, two square kilometers. Uh, they will go where they believe they can have a victory. It would be great if it was in the South, but they'll go where they can have a victory. And they will not play the game, which again, those timorous, timid officials on background play of saying, gee, we have to have that decisive victory now, otherwise supports Ukraine's going to end. If the administration really believes that, they should enable the decisive victory by setting the attackers and everything else. But even if, even if they are nervous about that, let's see Ukraine, again, have a, a counteroffensive which demonstrates this is not World War I, and then we'll, we'll take another look at the situation come the fall. I think I probably annoyed enough people with these remarks. Uh, I'll hold here. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I don't oh, wait think. A wait a minute, no, no, dear. There's one yeah. other thing. Uh, uh, we have not really talked about NATO. We, not, we have not really talked about the Vilnius summit. And here we're seeing that ca- characteristic administration timidity. They should be planning to use Vilnius to move well beyond Bucharest in integrating Ukraine into the uh, into a relationship with NATO. All indications are that what we are, what, seven and a half, eight weeks from, from the summit, and the administration is talking about something like Bucharest language. That's one more failed opportunity. Um, Sandy and Ian Brzezinski wrote a brilliant paper laying out what the Vilnius summit could do, how it could strengthen American, European, and Ukrainian security by taking steps, drawing Ukraine closer to the alliance. The administration, if it wants to have, if it wants to use Vilnius to strengthen our security and to establish a real legacy for itself in history, would use, would be do well to follow Sandy and Ian's script. Thank you. 
so much. Um, I think I, I don't think John, we we should be worrying about uh, annoying people. Or what was it the word you used? Uh, but it does seem to me that perhaps we need to squarely identify the responsibility of some of these um, possible outcomes as to who's playing what kind of role. And I think uh, this has been said by by all the panelists that, um, you know, the administration is now setting out like, oh, if it's not a decisive, um, you know, victory, you know, then support is going to wane. Well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? If we're not giving them the equipment they need to have that decisive um, a victory. But uh, going to the, the question of waning support, I think it has been discussed in previous uh, discussions that um, we are not telling the American people, we are not, uh, not, not necessarily selling, but explaining to the American people why Ukraine is important. And so the support is waning because they're not, there's no leadership in explaining uh, not only the strategic importance for us, as well as now the whole issue of the kind of war crimes that are being committed. We know that uh, recently the whole issue of the kidnapped children has become more and more visible and that we know that there is an absolutely visceral uh, reaction from the Americans when they hear about this. Uh, and that they are, uh, I think, would be supportive of doing everything we could to, st to stop this. Um, but Ben, getting back to uh, possible victory by the end of the summer, uh, I know we didn't perhaps didn't want to go into uh, the weapons uh, issue, but given what Ukraine already has, where is that path to success? Was that to Ben? Yes, that was to Ben. I'm sorry. So um, I do think that exactly what uh, Ambassador Herb said, that the uh, very, very few people know actually how this is going to unfold. And I think they must laugh to themselves when they hear there's so many experts asking, how come the spring offensive hadn't already started yet? You know, or, um, you know, everybody's... Uh, uh, an expert on what's going to happen. I certainly don't know where or when um, it's going to happen. But what I do uh, believe is that they have a lot more combat power than we think they do, that they have been, um, and this would have taken nerves of steel by the general staff and political courage by President Zelensky to withhold some of these newer capabilities, new brigades to keep them out of Bakhmut despite the enormous losses that the Ukrainians are suffering in Bakhmut, because they needed the time to get these armor brigades ready that will be used if and when and wherever this uh, counteroffensive actually takes place. And so uh, this, was a, this would have been a decision in, in terms of operational art, what we would call an economy of force mission, you needed the troops in around Bakhmut, many of which were territorial defense force units, to uh, continue to hold off the uh, Russian forces there to buy time. And, and I think because of that, there probably are several brigades that are equipped with the Ukrainian tanks and uh, armored fighting vehicles, captured Russian equipment. And then, of course, we know uh, a lot of Western uh, delivered equipment is in the hands and you've got units that have been training with it. I think the general staff is having to make a decision um, when you you're, you don't want to attack until the conditions are set. And one of the conditions, of course, is weather trafficability. But the other condition is, are your guys ready? Have you trained enough to be able to do this? Are you prepared to do it? Do you have the ammunition, the maintenance? all the stuff ready, because once it starts, you, you don't want to stop. I mean, it's you want to get momentum and keep going. Um, and then, of course, the enemy. One of the conditions is, what is what is the enemy? What, what have they been able to do to confuse the Russians about where, when, how this is going to happen? So there's a lot of factors, and I think the general staff uh, deserves the patience 
and our confidence, based on what they have done over the past 14 months, I am very impressed with how they've done this. And, you know, once it does happen, we'll all be slightly surprised, like, oh, dang, I didn't think of that, or wow, that was really something. And, and that's as it, as it should be. Um, I think the Russian, I would hate to be a Russian private sitting in one of these open trenches right now, um, anticipating pretty soon, I'm going to be looking up the business end of a, uh, of a Ukrainian tank. Bill, did you want to? I just wanted to do a <clears throat> small two finger pile on, pile on. Um, if, and I, I really like the way that Ben and others have characterized how, when, and where this counteroffensive may occur. But I think there's some, and you know, people believe that we're now past the point of helping it. I disagree. Um, you're beginning to see some reporting, and some of it fairly creditable, about how the Russian Air Force is beginning to have some successes. They're beginning to bring more pressure, et cetera. And what we do not want is in the face of a counteroffensive, now a resurgent Russian Air Force on the battlefield. We have uh, Ukrainian soldiers who have graduated and done extremely well in Patriot training. We have several nations pushing Patriots. We have other capabilities that we could bring to the battlefield even now that could help if we made a policy decision at the highest levels to do that. And I think this administration, rather than sitting back and fretting about this, the success of this, needs to look themselves in the face right now about what we can do in a sort of emergent sort of way, emergency sort of way to push forward capability to thwart any air incursion into the possibility of a successful Ukrainian operation. Over. So, Phil, do you think there is this self-reflection possibly taking place within our uh, military? Well, you asked me a different question than I thought. I thought you were about to ask me in our administration, and the answer would be no. Uh, but I do believe inside the military, people are thinking exactly what I'm thinking. The intelligence that I see, which is what you see, which is our people on the ground there and the reporting, is beginning to show that Russia gets it, that they haven't used their air force in a way that has brought uh, a lot of impact to the battlefield. And I think they are struggling because they see themselves not doing well with their spring offensive and their only way to now affect uh, the battle here coming is to try to thwart the Ukrainian offensive. And I think the Russians are beginning to think about how to do that. And I would uh, hope and believe and I fully expect our military is thinking about what they might do to help but it all starts with a policy decision to lean forward rather than to lean backward. Is there any hope for moving this uh, policy from uh, within our allies? Well, I, I would only answer with the facts that I see, and that is we have several allies that are providing patriots and other things. But what I think we really need is a sense of urgency right now. If we're truly fretting about the possibility of this not going well, what are we doing about it? And how is the United States of America leading others to do something right now, this week, impacting the battlefield in the next seven to 10 days, rather than thinking about down the line, over. If I haven't been very plain, I think there needs to be urgency in this discussion. Over. You know, one one question that, well, I think there's several questions in the question answer box about um, a little bit off the subject, but Germany and France selling military assistance to Russia. Um, any response or comment about that? If you haven't seen it, yeah, I, 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 this was a, this was an issue, of course, after the first invasion of Ukraine, 
in 2014, and it's been a lingering issue from that period of time to um, to the large scale invasion uh, last year. Uh, I'm not so sure it's a it's an issue now, other than the fact that everything the Russians were buying is now being used uh, in the conflict. But I don't I don't I don't think France and um, or other countries are uh, are um, actively selling military hardware to to Russia. Um, perhaps component parts uh, are being found uh, or being exported to Russia dual use, or they find their way to Russia, which implicates uh, unfairly maybe French companies. Uh, but I, I don't think there's some coordinated effort uh, to export defense hardware to Russia right now by any European country. Robert, I'm sorry, I'm having a hard time looking at uh, the questions. Can you please uh, see if there are any questions that uh, well, no, there's quite a few. Um, but I'll I'll jump around. Um, there's uh, you know, Irene asked a question that's pretty basic, and I don't I wish we all had the answer. Uh, who can influence the administration to move now? I'll throw that one out while I'm looking at the others. Um, I'll take a, a shot at that. Uh, I think all of us here are frustrated again by the slowness of the administration's response to this danger. But I think we've seen the things that do have an impact that help move the administration in the right way, albeit maybe it's too slowly. One is um, the latest Russian atrocity. That that may, that's certainly the the big infrastructure bombing campaign that began in October led to an immediate turnaround on patriots. We've been saying no, no, no to patriots for many months, and suddenly it was yes. Uh, we've seen how pressure from our allies, the Brits have been tougher, have been more realistic than the administration on this Russian danger. So when the Brits and the Poles and the Balts got serious about tanks, the administration finally tried to persuade Germany for the first time, truly really tried to persuade Germany. And because the Germans wouldn't move without us sending Abrams, we sent Abrams. So we see, you see how our allies can move us in the right direction. We also know that um, criticism from Congress and urging from Congress can, can move them. And even criticism from gadflies like us sometimes play a role. What we don't know is what precisely sets them off. And we cannot predict the timing. But these are the things that explain why the administration, like a ratchet ladder that always moves up, up is does move, albeit slowly uh, and unpredictably. I would just add that uh, the administration did move on the Abrams tanks when, when this first became a live subject. It was next year is the earliest possible Correct. time they could be delivered. Correct. And it was much later this year, but not in time for the spring offensive. Suddenly, they're going to be there within days. Right. So uh, advocates like this group should, should never take no for an answer. But the administration exactly. should stop playing these kinds of games. Right. Why say no and then turn around uh, two, two or three or four weeks later? Why don't you it's, just do, it, do the right thing in the first place? It, it's, it's amazing. It's as if the administration thinks that somehow if Ukraine goes down, this is not going to be pegged as their greatest foreign policy disaster. So they, they, refra they refuse to say we have a vital interest in stopping Russia and Ukraine because they're afraid of the consequences, not realizing those consequences are going to be there. And if our overly timid power and policy leads to that result, they'll have earned. They'll have earned it. Well, we've we've pushed for a long time this group and others in the group for a strong statement from the administration that it supports a Ukraine victory as defined by Ukraine. And of course, that hasn't happened. We've all just talked about that. But I mean, that's where it is. And, you know, I, we keep talking about the administration and I hesitate to insert this. There's been three administrations that have not handled Ukraine correctly. Uh, we're talking about this one now because we're, it's the one in office and the critical point is coming now. But uh, the United States has, has been timid at best for three administrations in addressing this uh, the actions of uh, Russia. Well, we can go back to uh, 1990, 91 with the chicken Kiev speech. Um, so we've been timid and uh, and worrying, I think, about the wrong uh, 
uh, outcomes uh, going way back. Uh, John, I think you the point you bring up and and the one that actually, Phil, you started when you uh, were going through the reasons why it's in our U.S. interest. And I think the new dimension of the fact that Putin has been now identified as um, a war criminal committing genocide. It seems to me that that maybe needs to be stressed more because it's it's now uh, if we're not doing anything, everything to defeat this uh, present war criminal. That's something else that's going to be in our conscience. Well, and Nadia, I'd take it one step forward. If we begin to appease and accept where we are with this current war criminal, I think we buy into it. And I don't think people are, are, are really talking about that. It, it, it's bigger than calling him to task. It is tacit approval by not taking the actions that are required. Here, here you come to the inconsistency of the administration's policy. I mean, Biden has been enthusiastically labeling Putin a war criminal for many months. And in fact, it's really quite amazing. I think it was around the time of the Munich Security Conference that uh, th this all began gathering uh, momentum and Biden outspokenly slammed Putin as a war criminal. And I remember in Munich watching a, a, an American realist, I will be discreet and not mention the name, speaking with great anxiety and unhappiness about that statement. Because he realized that makes it harder for the administration to pursue the type of policies that this gentleman wanted to pursue, meaning appeasing Russia, letting them have its share of Ukraine. But the administration doesn't behave as if it understands, again, that connection between making that call out and then pursuing a policy that's insufficiently strong in helping Ukraine win. So perhaps that's the task before us to connect those dots very clearly so that you cannot, let's say, walk between them, uh, be uh, proclaiming, you know, uh, putting a war criminal and yet not doing everything we can to uh, deter and uh, de defeat him. Defeat. Yes. And, you know, talking of, and Crimea uh, certainly fits into this uh, discussion debate because Crimea really is one of the key centers of uh, war crimes being committed uh, going back to 2014. So again, uh, in terms of uh, discussion Crimea and where, where <clears throat> do we want to really um, give what Macron wants, um, did he say he wanted to, uh, Putin to lose with dignity? Uh, do we give, uh, do we reward a war criminal with one of his uh, greatest uh, acts of, uh, of crimes? Yeah, I, if I may jump in on this, uh, I think we all agree and we understand why these issues are important to U.S. interests around the world, whether it's um, holding those accountable who commit these uh, atrocities or um, the primacy of the uh, of the nation state, the fact that in the 21st century, we, we can't allow the precedent of using military force to take territory of another country. I mean, the last time this was done was Saddam Hussein in 1990. So, you know, we, there's quite a gap even from the last time it happened to, to uh, this current uh, situation with Russia and um, Ukraine. But I think the, the president and the, our leaders need to do a better job at articulating and communicating to the American people why they should care. And, and you can't tell um, the American people that we have to spend uh, billions of dollars to preserve the rules-based order because nobody knows really what that means. Um, you have to explain in economic terms what the implications and the impacts could be if this war spreads uh, beyond Ukraine. Uh, North America and Europe together account for about 44% of global GDP. We're each other's number one source of foreign investment. We're each responsible for the creation of millions of jobs on either side of the Atlantic. And we're each other's number one export partner. And, and when an American is exporting a service or a product to Europe, that means an American job. Uh, so right now, Putin is trying to undermine the stability 
in Europe that has led to the economic prosperity that benefits the American worker here in the United States. Uh, 45 out of 50 American states export more to Europe than to China. So we need to start talking about the, the implications and consequences of this conflict in ways that the American worker understands and how it could impact their pocketbook, their bank accounts. And that's the messages we should be hearing more from the president. Of course, when he, you know, he also needs to do a better job on Capitol Hill explaining to you know all sides why it's in America's interests and 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 he can you know use some of these other terms uh, when he's explaining to policymakers but you know to your average person on the street you need to boil it down to the issues that really impact them the most and that is probably the economic implications of having a Europe that's in turmoil because of conflict bill uh, I think you had wanted to perhaps uh make a few comments. No, no, <clears throat> I just wanted to maybe add a tiny bit to what Luke said, and he can disagree with me, please. He said, if this war spreads, I think another thing that our, our leadership is not doing right now is pointing out that it already is spreading. What is going on in Georgia is not happenstance. This is at purpose by Russia. What has gone on already and continues to go on in Moldova, removing Western leaders or Western, removing leaders who have a Western slant. These are all at, pro, uh, at purpose by Russia. And I don't think again, that our nation is doing a good job of pointing out to Americans that it is bigger than Ukraine. We grieve and work for Ukraine, but in the two documents, Mr. Putin made it very clear that this is much, much, let me say it one more time, much more than just Ukraine. And I think it's already happening. Sorry, Luke, if I stepped on what you intended. There's a one that sort of goes into this. There's a question in the uh, question box. With Russia's push to establish a confederation of anti-Western states in Africa and Russian influence in some South American countries, how will those realities impact the continued U.S. and European military and national economic support for Ukraine in the long term? I mean, I think that goes to the whole point. It, it's not Russia is on the is pushing everywhere. It's not just in Ukraine. And it's not for our best interest. And this is the big difference on how we view these challenges compared to our Russian counterparts. I think many of us, we tend to stovepipe these different challenges and issues, whereas Russia sees, the Kremlin sees all these issues as being connected. When, when Russia goes to set at its Ukrainian poker table, it brings its poker chips from the Sub-Saharan Africa poker table or the Syria poker table or the Arctic poker table. Uh, we, we don't do this. And, and we, we should be seeing how all these different issues are, are more aligned and connected in order to achieve it, to achieve a, a greater effect to promote our interests. Look, I would also add uh, to get a complete picture about, I think somebody mentioned about, uh, you know, what's going on in the far extreme right of the Republican you know, party in terms of uh, opposing aid to Ukraine. But you know that's low hanging fruit to see the obvious. Uh, we also need to be looking at what's happening on the other side of the aisle uh, in terms of how the progressives are looking at defense budgets or what's happening in, in other parts of the world. Uh, the fact that uh, you know, the Olympics are gonna be talk are talking about including uh, Russian athletes again in the Olympic games. So we're seeing that there's been a sea change also in terms of people who want to support um, the Kremlin. They're becoming more visible. Uh, what, how many months ago was there a, <clears throat> a rally in Berlin? I think 12,000 people showed up to oppose support uh, for Ukraine. So th there, it, it's we, we have to see globally what is taking place in terms of uh, uh, you know, successes of what I would call Putin's propaganda and disinformation. Yeah, the, the, the there was just a letter uh, published recently by uh, a handful of Republican uh, members of Congress and, and senators, and 
You know, if you look at the names on the letter, there were no surprises. In fact, the, the numbers of those who uh, at, least, at least signed this letter compared to voted against the, the larger aid packages last year, there has been no significant uh, increase. Uh, so I think you just have this example of the, you know, the far left and the far right sort of meeting up. And now you have this curious situation where someone like Marjorie Taylor Greene and AOC are both aligned <laughs> in their worldview. Uh, so I think um, for all of us who know why it's important to support Ukraine, we keep driving on, we keep uh, spreading the messages, we keep working with our interlocutors on Capitol Hill, and, and we just kind of, we, we should do our best to drown out and ignore the, the noises coming from the, from the far fringes of uh, both parties. Phil? I, I just, uh, I completely agree with Luke. I do want to point out, and I answered actually the question in the, in the queue, uh, that we are reaching out to some of these people. Um, I'll only speak to the, th I've reached out personally to three because one of them is my congressman. Uh, and so the, we are trying to uh, address these, these people who are, are in a really different place. We'll just leave it at that. You know, uh, one of the questions just asked in the in the box is, what I what I don't understand is, doesn't Biden himself understand that his presidency and reelection is highly dependent on whether Ukraine wins this war? Why doesn't he get it? You know, I can't answer that question, Anders, but I can say that I'm wondering if these leaks that we were talking about earlier, leaks or the reports, the people in the administration are worried about you know, they're boxed in uh, on this uh, counteroffensive. If it doesn't work, it was it their fault. If it does work, it, uh, maybe they're starting to do some self-evaluation that they haven't done in a long time, and it's long overdue. The way to solve all the problems that, that uh, they talk about in that particular article in Politico is to give Ukraine what it needs right this minute. And I will add a, as a question to other panelists, we keep hearing about Ukraine running out of ammunition and, and the missiles and so forth. Uh, how accurate do we think that is and what are we doing about it? Ben? <laughs> so <clears throat> I think uh, there's no doubt that Ukraine is expending enormous amounts of ammunition uh, but this, the specifics are something that they would have protected uh, very carefully. So we don't, just like we don't know how many troops they actually have or how many casualties they've actually had. I don't imagine we have a very accurate sense of what ammunition they have. The good news is uh, the United States and others, but the United States, our country, has tripled artillery ammunition production in just one year. I mean that that's amazing. Uh, we were producing uh, 8,000 rounds of 155 millimeter ammunition every month because that's about what we expend per month for training. Uh, it's now up to 24,000 rounds a month, and they plan to triple that in the in the coming year. So uh, that kind of ammunition, I don't think there's any delay on pushing to the Ukrainians what they need. But of course, that's not the only thing. The uh, it's the air and missile defense capabilities. Mm -hmm. Uh, that they need. I, I think, you know, that was one of the things that was in the leaks that came out that would not have been a huge surprise to anybody. But um, if that is, in fact, the case, then hopefully the administration is moving out on it. And I think that was one of the priorities from last week's uh, Ramstein contact group. Robert, is that a, it for questions? Oh, there's a lot of questions. I, I, I'm hoping that we can, our uh, staff can copy them and we can respond some by type. Uh, it's hard to run through. Well, okay, here's one. Luke Coffee hit the nail on the head. Abstract arguments won't work with constituents or members of Congress. I deal with them every day. Thank you. Uh, I mean, thank you for dealing with them every day. Whoever <laughs> asked that question. <laughs> Well, and we're and 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 we're trying to do that all the time. I can say this group certainly knows it. We're about ready to publish the Friends of Ukraine Network's recommendations, which we've done every year. 
we publish them, we deliver them on Congress and in the executive, and then we go up and we pitch them and explain them and hammer on them. And that process is just about ready to begin with the publishing. So I think we're uh, about to, close to the end of our time. So uh, why don't we just go around for some closing comments? Uh, let's start with Phil. Okay, thank you for putting this on again and a spirited discussion. And I learn every time I listen to this group. Um, mm -hmm. I, I would just offer that everything I believe starts with policy. Our US policy right now is deterred. Mr. Putin's army is essentially not meeting his expectations on the battlefield and is, is not serving its uh, nation well. But what is working well for Mr. Putin is his war of intimidation or in our parlance, his war of deterrence. <clears throat> we are com nearly completely deterred in any options that would help Ukraine to win because of our fear of what happens if Ukraine wins. We first and foremost have to get past that policy hurdle. Thank you. Luke? When, uh, when Ukraine starts its counterattack, everyone needs to be patient. We're not gonna know if this was a success or a failure for months. Just because in the first 24 hours, you see some TikTok video of a Ukrainian vehicle burning doesn't mean it's been a, a failure. Uh, so we have to be more strategic and long-term and, and be patient and have faith in the Ukrainians and continue to supply them with the, the weapons and, and the equipment that they need uh, to make this a success. Robert? Well, I'll just, I think it was Luke a little bit ago who said, drew back the example of uh, Saddam Hussein going into Kuwait. What did the United States do? It wasn't deterred. It knew what its superpower needed to do. It put together an alliance and it went in and cleared it out. That's the kind of mentality, the commitment we need now from our administration. Ben? So uh, when U.S. Grant was the commander of the Union Army, uh, it took, when he took command of the Army of the Potomac, and, and uh, he was beset with worrisome subordinate commanders. They were like, oh, my God, you better watch out. Robert E. Lee is going to do this. Robert E. Lee is going to do that. We better be careful. Robert E. Lee is going to do that. And Grant looked at them and said, I'm sick and tired of hearing what you're worried that Robert E. Lee might do to us. He should be worried about what we're going to do to him. And so it was a, a change of mindset. Quit worrying so much about what the enemy might do. And we all know this. Russia is not going to use a nuclear weapon. I think the Russian general staff knows that if they did use a nuclear weapon, Ukrainians are going to keep fighting. They're not going to all of a sudden surrender. And so then once they've used a nuke, the Ukrainians keep fighting, then what? So the general staff knows there is no other thing there. So their nukes are only good as long as they don't use it. That's why I think they won't actually use them. The Russian people have no desire for this fight. You, you could not fill up a school bus with a number of Russian troops that actually really want to be in Ukraine. So you know, I keep hearing about, oh, my God, there's hundreds of kilometers of trenches and dragon's teeth. <laughs> You've all seen the same video I do. These are open ditches. None of them have overhead cover. And it's the same unlucky, unhappy Russian troops sitting in those trenches that have been getting slaughtered everywhere else. After nine years, nine years, Russia still has not achieved air superiority. They have not destroyed one single train or convoy bringing the equipment and ammunition from Poland not in nine years. The Navy, all they can do is launch missiles against apartment buildings, fixed sites. They are not able to hit any moving targets. So I think that uh, people are wringing their hands like, oh, the, the Ukrainian attack might not succeed. Uh, I, I will take that bet. Dandy, any bets? <laughs> <laughs> well, hard, hard to top the uh, other, other final comments. Uh, clearly, we have to keep working at it. I'm, I'm not quite as pessimistic as others that the administration doesn't realize that what we've done to date is going to fall short in terms of the counteroffensive if we don't scramble to get more of the vital uh, capabilities that they need. I take a little bit of encouragement by the shift on the, on the timing of the tanks, but there's still a lot more that needs to be done. 
And I think the administration hasn't faced up to the fact that if we don't ramp up the support significantly and, and Ukraine does end up in, in more of a stalemate than, in, in, than gaining a lot of territory, it's going to reflect very badly on the administration's success. Nobody's going to remember that we've been very successful in the first three quarters of the game if we if we, we lose in, at the buzzer in the fourth quarter. So uh, at the same time, I do want to agree with those who emphasize the importance of our messaging as, as a country. We need to explain to our own people why this is important. We have to find some other phrase than the rules-based order to explain what's at stake. Maybe metaphors regarding you know, the rule of law versus the law of the jungle, or we don't let bullies take take control of the of the playground or something like that. Uh, but that's a, that's an important part of the case. And the other aspect of information warfare is the external audiences. We need to do much more to uh, get the message out to the uh, global south that this war is not our fault. It's not because of NATO expansion. It's about imperial expansionism uh, and revanchism on the part of Putin. Uh, because we're we're losing big time in, in the in the global information war, uh, and that's only advantaging the Russians. Uh, and at the same time, we need to. The, the hardest part is getting through to the Russian public, uh, but there are ways to do that using social media and VPNs and other things. Uh, they need to understand that, on the one hand, horrific crimes are being committed by Russia on, in their name. Uh, and secondly, they need to understand that we are not in this game to destroy or demolish Russia as the Russian narrative would have it. Uh, we're ready to peacefully coexist with a democratic Russia that stops trying to solve solve its problems with its neighbors by force, maybe years before we can ever have a decent relationship. But again, the, the Russian narrative is that this is a war to destroy Russia and there's a rally around the flag or circle the wagons effect because of that. And we, we have to do what we can to counter it. Thank you, Sandy. John? Um, I, I would just follow up on Sandy's comments regarding the administration. Um, it's true, they do move in the right direction, although always after a lag. So we may see additional steps in that direction. We simply cannot count on it, and we have to encourage it. And as part of that, we should be doing more. Um, again, Sandy's taken a lead on this, on getting the administration to look for a more ambitious agenda for the Vilnius NATO summit. And for sure, for an ambitious agenda when we have our NATO summit here next year. John, thank you so much for your um, participation and, of course, your leadership. Um, and and thank you. Nadia? Yes. There have been multiple times that Sandy's paper on, on NATO has been mentioned. If any of our viewers want it, it's both on the Atlantic Council website and on the U.S. Ukraine Foundation's website called yeah. Memo to NATO Leaders. Yeah. Um, I want to thank our, our panelists and the other members of the task force. I think this task force has been working, uh, I would say, 24-7 since 2014. And I think that the work um, that you're doing both publicly and uh, behind the scenes, I think, is bearing fruit. And um, I think that um, we've come up with an action plan about uh, needing to increase um, our messaging, uh, not only to the administration, but to help formulate a messaging, uh, messaging to the uh, American public. So thank you very much. Um, and till the next time. Mm -hmm.